just get going. All right, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to the Open Deep Dive on uh, at 5:20 on Wednesday, right before the all attendee party. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about something very exciting today, which is policy. Uh, it's my favorite way to kind of unwind. Um, so uh, I'm Torin. I'm an engineer at Styra, and I'm one of the co-creators of Open Policy Agent. And I'm joined here by Tim, who can introduce himself. How are y'all doing? Uh, Tim Henricks, uh, the CTO at Styra, one of the co-creators of Opa as well. Um, so what we thought we'd do today is kind of talk a little bit about Opa, give it an overview for people that might have kind of heard about it for the first time um, at this conference. And then we thought we'd do a bit of a use case deep dive and do some live coding, and then kind of talk about some new features that you know, we've been working on and that we plan to work on in the near future. Um, so just as like a, just to get a gauge, like how, who, how many people here had heard about OPA for the first time at this, this conference? So, all right, all right, that's a pretty good, pretty good number. How many of you have um, had heard about OPA before and had tried it out? Okay, some. And how many of you are like maybe running it somewhere in production? Okay, a few. All right, so I think this is gonna be a useful um, session for, for everybody in the room. Um, so, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit in the keynote, um, like kind of why OPA exists, right? And I think that, like, when you look at the modern uh, kind of, like, cloud-native, like, ecosystem, there's just a lot of choice out there, right? And it feels like there's, like, this never-ending uh, list of new projects um, to do with, you know, CICD and microservices and, you know, databases and programming languages and runtime pl platforms and so on, right? And so if you work in a large enterprise or a large organization, um, that's just like a fact of life. If you're, if you're an architect or a platform engineer or somebody, you know, a security engineer, um, you just have to deal with this, this diversity. And the, the, the challenge is that every single one of those, these kind of projects typically ends up almost reinventing the wheel a little bit when it comes to policy and authorization. And the result of that is is kind of an overall security posture that's hard to assess and a, and a kind of a system that's harder to control. And then on top of that, um, you know, a lot of the, like the older systems that help you kind of control access um, were not really designed for, you know, modern environments that are typically very dynamic, um, where workloads are ephemeral, where they come and go, um, and where they're kind of like operating in a self-service fashion, right? So this was sort of the problem that we, that we saw um, when we, before we started the project. And, and so that's why we, we thought, you know, let's, let's try to fix this. And so we, we basically created the Open Policy Agent as a way to give you a tool that you could leverage to, to really, you know, improve how systems are, are managed, right? So instead of, you know, putting policies on, on wikis or in spreadsheets, um, you know, we said there's a, there's a better way of doing this. And so, you know, we started the Open Policy Agent and we, we released it um, four years ago. The mics just changed. That's nice. Um, and... Um, and yeah, and so like over the last you know, couple of years, we've seen a lot of different integrations get built um, for OPA. And these are all examples of um, integrations where people are actually running them in production, right? So you, know, you hear lots about how people are using OPA for Kubernetes around admission control. Um, you hear lots about how people are using it for uh, microservice API authorization. Um, but there's a long tail of use cases as well where people you know, use OPA to control access to sensitive data in, in different kind of data lake environments. Uh, where they use it in CI/CD pipelines to, you know, impose best practices on, on, on applications and configuration. Um, we even have people that use OPA to restrict SSH access um, to, to servers. All right, so, you know, OPA really is being used to, to unify policy across the stack. Um, one of the things that we just recently launched was this little integration index on the OPA website. Um, so we're trying to kind of collect all of the integrations that we know about uh, into one place where you can kind of go and browse and see um, see them there in, in kind of one place and search for them and filter and just see what's out there. Because I think a lot of the time people think, oh, OPA is purpose-built for Kubernetes or it only does Kubernetes. Um, but the fact is that it, it's, it's kind of widely applicable and, and this is kind of shown off a little bit in the, in the integration index. Actually, this, this screenshot's out of date. I think it looks slightly different now. There's been some, some new additions recently. So, um, you know, what is OPA? OPA is a, a general purpose policy engine. And so what that means is that you can kind of like use it to offload policy decision making um, from your software. Now, the, re the reason we call it general purpose is because it works with all these different kinds of, of software. So, you know, whether you're talking about Kubernetes or Envoy or Linux PAM, um, you know, you can take OPA and you can use it to basically help enforce policy or authorization decisions 
in those, in those technologies. Um, the way that, that OPA typically works, or the way it's typically used, um, is that services like software is integrated with it to query OPA for policy decisions when they're needed. So for example, if you were building a, a microservice and that microservice exposed an HTTP API, then any time the service received an HTTP request, it would be programmed to call out to OPA and ask, should this HTTP request be allowed? And then OPA would take the rules and, and whatever other data that were required for the policy decision, and it would evaluate the, the, the query against those, that, those policies and produce a decision which would send back to the, the service to get enforced. So the core thing you're kind of doing here is you're decoupling policy decision making um, from policy enforcement. Now, um, one, of the, one of the design decisions that we made when we started the project, which was an important one, was that OPA wasn't going to be coupled to any um, project or domain specific data model. Um, and so inside of these policy queries, you can actually supply arbitrary JSON data. You can supply any JSON value you want. So this can be a pod, it can be a representation of an HTTP API request, so it would contain things like the method and the path and the headers and so on. Um, or it could be a representation of you know, an SSH connection into a server. And then similarly, the decision that OPA sends back to the service to be enforced can also be any JSON value. So in a simple API access control use case, it could be true or false. Um, but it could be any JSON value. So you know, it could be a string. It could be an error message. It could be a set of strings. It could be a set of error messages. Um, or it could be like a, you know, a complex JSON object. So when people first deployed OPA uh, for admission control in Kubernetes, they would just have a policy that would generate the admission review structure and send that back. And that's like a deeply nested JSON object. Right? So with, with OPA, it's kind of like just JSON coming in, JSON being evaluated, and JSON going out. And so this is why we call it general purpose. Now, obviously, your, uh, your, your policies have to understand the semantics of, of the input, right? They need to understand that that's a pod represented in JSON, and they need to make sense of that. Um, and similarly, your, your service needs, how to, needs to know the semantics of the, the decision coming back. Um, but on its own, OPA doesn't. And that's why, it's, that's why it's general purpose. That's why you can use it for all of these different use cases. So. What OPA actually gives you at a high level is kind of summarized here. The, the kind of core thing that it provides is a high level declarative language um, for expressing policy in. And what that language is really good at doing is helping you write rules that answer questions that are relevant to policy. So things like, can this user perform this operation on this resource? You know, which invariants does this workload, you know, would this workload violate if it were to be deployed? Or you know, which records am I, am I allowed, to, or is, is a user allowed to see? Um, and so since, this, since we're you know, operating with JSON everywhere, um, OPA, the language has kind of built-in mechanisms for you know, doing everything you'd expect with large, complex, hierarchical data. So you can kind of like dot into complex objects. You can do scans over arrays. Um, you, know, you, can, you can do all kinds of things. Uh, when it comes to actually using OPA, um, you can either run it, you can use it as a library. It's written in Go, so you can embed it quite easily into, into Go services and applications. Um, or you can run it as a, as a daemon. And the daemon is designed to be as lightweight as possible. So you can use it as a sidecar or a host-level daemon. Or if you want to stand it up as a service, you can. But the way that we think of OPA um, as the like, kind of creators of it is that it's meant to be used as a host local cache for policy decision making. So we recommend that you take OPA and you run it as close to the thing that needs decision making as possible. The reason why we recommend that you do that is because if every single time OPA has to, or the service has to get a decision, it has to call out over the network, then you know, you, you, like you're gonna pay a performance hit for that, right? There's gonna be extra latency introduced into the request path. And if you're dealing with, say, like a microservice architecture where you know, several microservices might be invo involved in the servicing of a, of a top level request, then that starts to add up. Um, also, importantly, if every time you have to make a decision, you have to call out over the network, then you're gonna be, your availability is going to be impacted by the network. It's going to be impacted by the machine where OPA is running on. Um, and so you know, the model that we recommend that you use is like you run OPA as close to the service as possible to reduce the impact on latency and reduce the impact on availability. Now, in order to make it possible to run it like that, um, we made certain design decisions. And one of those is that on its own, OPA doesn't kind of bring any database into the picture. So you can deploy OPA, it'll keep all of the policy and data that it uses to evaluate decisions in memory. And when you ask it for a decision, it's not going to call out 
over the network to get anything else on its own. So all of the decision making can happen locally on that node. Now we do have mechanisms where you can like call out on the fly inside the policy if you want, but we recommend that as much as possible you, you avoid trying to do that if you don't need to. Now obviously if you have a bunch of OPAs running around in your infrastructure and they're all storing policy and data in memory, you, know, you need some way to manage them. You need a source of truth for the policy and the data. And so OPA exposes a set of management APIs that let you do things like distribute policy down to it. So we have this thing called the bundle API, um, where basically you can configure OPA to periodically call out to a remote HTTP endpoint and request the latest version of a set of policy and data. And then OPA will, you know, the service will respond and send that, that gzip tarball containing Rego files and JSON files down to OPA and it'll, it'll activate them. We also have uh, APIs for, for visibility though. So we have like a status API that you can configure to receive status updates from OPA that can tell, tell you the version of the bundle that's, the, the bundles that have been activated or whether there were any errors trying to activate the last version um, that, it, that it got. And then we also have a, what we call the decision log API. So the decision log is basically a record of all the policy decisions that have been made by OPA over the past few minutes, let's say. So every time you ask OPA for a policy decision, it keeps a little record of that in memory. And what it'll do is it'll periodically upload those records to a remote HTTP endpoint. And the, the powerful thing there is that inside those decision log records, you have the full extent of the input data, the input JSON that was supplied to OPA in the policy query. You also have the revision of the policy bundle, and you have the decision that was made. So you have a full record of the policy decision-making process. And so you can send that up, you can use it for audit purposes. It's, it's useful for a lot of other things like debug and test as well. And so the last thing I'll just mention here is that OPA also kind of embodies this idea of policy as code. And so it's got a kind of a rich tool chain that helps you build, test, and debug your policies. We have like an interactive shell that you can use to run queries, interact with policies, kind of experiment with them. Um, we have a test framework. So you can write like unit tests for your policies and verify that they're correct before you go off and deploy them. This is something that we recommend that people do when, they, when they're writing policy, because it's, 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 you, know, you want to make sure that it's correct. Um, we had one user that was like taking OPA and they, were, they had to ship it to a customer and run it in, a, in an air-gapped environment for a hedge fund. And the ability that, like, to test their policies up front and gain you know, confidence in their correctness before they handed this off into like, an air-gapped environment where they weren't going to be able to go in and change anything was like, instrumental in, in their success. So the test framework is a really powerful thing that you can, that you can use with OPA. We also have like IDE extensions. So there's a VS Code plugin that you can use to kind of um, develop the policies. You can do interactive evaluation, you can run tests, you can get coverage. Um, it's quite useful. And then we also have other things like tracing and profiling that are more sort of advanced. All right, so at this point I'm gonna hand it over to Tim who's gonna do a little bit of a, a use case deep dive. Um, so take it away. Thank you. All right, so. Uh, Real quick, we're gonna do a deep dive on Kubernetes. Um, give you sort of an example of how the integration works. We saw it in the abstract a moment ago, so we'll see how that works with Kubernetes specifically. And then we'll go ahead and do some live coding. Um, that's always fun for the audience. Um, all right, so uh, this is sort of a, a zoom in on Kubernetes. Um, we've heard a moment ago how any service, whether it's Kubernetes or otherwise, is going to be uh, asking OPA for decisions from time to time. Now in the Kubernetes case, this happens every time someone tries to create, update, or delete a resource uh, on the cluster. Uh, and so as uh, I would expect many people here already know, inside of the Kubernetes API server, there's, a, a, there's an entire pipeline that every request goes through. Uh, it starts with authentication, who are you, then goes on, on to authorization, RBOC, uh, and then finally it goes to admission, and at admission control, there are now validating webhooks. There are mutating webhooks as well. But there are webhooks that you can set up, and that is where OPA integrates. So in this world, every time a new request comes into the cluster, that request makes its way down to admission, let's say. Uh, and the uh, Kubernetes API server hands that request over to OPA. Uh, and then I'll show you an example of this in a moment. Uh, and then OPA makes a decision. Is this authorized or not? And it returns an admission review response. That admission review response includes uh, error messages that get returned to the user. All right? This is a pretty standard, um, this is the standard uh, integration uh, and, and there are different ways of embodying this, but, but that's what uh, we're gonna see. So that is OPA, uh, and then what we're gonna do now uh -huh, 
is flip over and do a little bit of live coding. Okay, so let's do this. All right. Nice. Okay. All right, any time that I am writing any sort of policy, the first thing I do is I grab a sample of the input that's going to be handed over to OPA. So in this case, from Kubernetes, that would be an admission review re uh, request. And so here on the right-hand side, you can see that written in, jo uh, in, in <laughs> JSON. Uh, what I'm actually opening here is the Rego Playground. I forgot to mention this. So this is a purpose-built editor uh, that, uh, that is available that allows you to not only do syntax highlighting and evaluation of policy, but it also allows you to share that policy with others. Uh, and that's really helpful. If you ever jump onto Slack, which we encourage definitely, uh, and you have questions, put it in the playground. It's much easier to exchange uh, ideas and, and tips over, over the playground. So on the right-hand side there, we see the input uh, that OPA is going to receive. In this particular example, for those of you who haven't seen an, an admission review um, object before, this is the way it works. Uh, the request there is where all the action is at. It gives you a kind here. Uh, it's got the usual group version kind, as you would expect. It tells you what namespace the object belongs to, if it belongs to a namespace. And then here under object is where we see what we would typically think of as the object that we're handing over to Kubernetes uh, API server. So it's got metadata here. It's got, um, it's got a spec, because this is, after all, a pod. It's got the containers there within the spec. It's got the init containers, that's great. And it's got an operation, which is create in this case. All right, so that's an example of the input that's going to come into the, to, to OPA. Um, and now our job as policy authors is to go ahead and write whatever policy we care about, right? Um, and so in this example, what we're going to do is ensure that all the images that show up in a pod come from a trusted registry. That registry is hooli.com. All right, so the way we're going to get this started is that we know what the input is, and so I, as an author, um, there's a little bit of boilerplate for often for, for Kubernetes. Uh, I won't bother showing you the boilerplate, but what I will show you is the, is the core of the logic. And the core of that logic, at, at the end of the day, is going to be we're going to be writing uh, deny statements. And so, as you would expect with OPA, uh, it's a policy language. We expect to be able to write a bunch of allows and denies. So let's go ahead and start that here. Um, in OPA, you're writing a number of different rules. Um, where here we're just going to write a deny. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to check uh, that, in fact, we're only going to be applying this rule to pods. And so how do we do that? Well, input, here's a keyword for OPA. It, it uh, is assigned to that value that you see on the right-hand side. And so if I do input.request.kind.kind, .kind, uh, then I can check that that is actually equal to pod. All right, input.request.kind. Now that everybody I would expect could, could, could kind of guess what that's going to do. It does what you would expect. All right, so first we know it's a pod, and now we want to check that all images come from this trusted registry. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to start the same way. We're going to start dotting down through that object in order to grab the list of containers that exist. So input.request.object.spec.containers. Well, if we kind of look at that. Okay, so that's, a, that's an array of containers. Great, okay, but now we have an array of containers, so we don't want to dot down through it anymore. We need to iterate. All right, how are we going to iterate? Well, we're going to iterate with sum. All right, so we're going to say that here there is some i, um, and then we're going to go ahead and actually grab, after that i, the image name. So for each of the elements in this container's array, we have an image field, so we'll go ahead and grab it, and we'll assign it to a variable, image name. Um, and now uh, we just need to check that, this, uh, that if this image name fails to start with huli.com, then in fact we want to deny, right? So not starts with. Starts with is uh, what we call a built-in in OPA. It's just a, some pre-built code that helps us do things like string manipulation and the like. Image name is huli.com. All right. Um, let's, give it a, let's give it a try. Has anybody seen any bugs? We're good, I think. I okay, we're good. All right, let's give it a try. It is late. It's late. Fine. All right, so let's go ahead here and hit this evaluate button and resize the window so we can see the result. Oh, wonderful. All right, deny is true. So why is deny true? Because if we look at the containers, there is an image here, Nginx. It does not come from Huli.com, so that is denied. This is sort of incomplete, though, because what we all know is that we want more information back than simply no. Try again. 
What we want to be able to do is return error messages, and so the way that we do that is that we go ahead and um, add a term deny instead of a Boolean. Remember, uh, open can return decisions that are not just true, false, not just Booleans, but could return any JSON object. We're going to actually turn deny into basically a set. Uh, think of a set as basically an array. Uh, but here what we're going to do then is we're going to turn deny into a set, and we're going to do, uh, and we're going to return a, a set of error messages back to the user. So as printf um, uh, pod contains an image from an untrusted registry v and do image name, image name. All right. Let's try it. All right, wonderful. OK, so now we've got a little bit more information. Deny, here pod contains an image from, OK, it's Nginx, as we would expect. That's wonderful. That's great. Uh, and, and this is typically how we write uh, policies for Kubernetes. We do actually turn, return a set. And then that, those error messages get sent back to the, to the user. Um, but there's a bug. Anybody see it? Just a head nod. That's true. That's very good. That's a very deep question, though. Um, we're, we're, uh, I mentioned this earlier. If we look at the input, uh, containers is one of the fields under spec, but so is init containers. Black. OK, so we should be checking both the containers and the init containers, let's say. So one way to do this is to just take this rule, um, and we can make a copy of it. And then we can just go in here and change containers to init containers. And then we should be good. Of course, that's not, well, let's see if it worked. OK, well, that's great. So now we get two answers. Pod, it's Nginx and BusyBox. I didn't really show you. But BusyBox is one of the init containers. OK, so that's OK, uh, fine. Um, but at the same time, nobody, if you're writing code, would copy and paste like that. So what we might want to do is actually go ahead and uh, add an abstraction here. So one of the interesting things is that with OPA, allow and deny are not keywords. They're just, they're just more variables. You just get to make them whatever you want. Uh, and so in addition to that, we can, we can build our own. We can build a, a helper here called uh, container uh, C. We're going to make it another set. And what we're going to do is we're going to make this true of all of the con uh, containers as well as the uh, init containers. So if we do C equals of I, and I should make that a sum. OK, so now what we're saying here is go ahead and grab the, uh, all the containers in the object. Go ahead and grab all of the init containers in the object. Uh, and now I've got this set containers, which I can use however I like, but I'm going to use it inside of the rule. So let's get rid of this guy. We don't need him anymore. And so now instead of this, I'm going to do input is going to be, let's just do containers of C. And let's just do it this way, c.image name, c.image, yes? Sub C. What? Sub C. Sub C? Some I to sub C. Oh, thank you. Very good. Keep me honest. Pair programming. OK, great. Um, OK, so now, assuming this is all right, we can go ahead and evaluate it. Hopefully it'll work. One of the things that's happening here is that when I hit evaluate, I'm actually evaluating all of those symbols in the, in the policy. And so what you see as output here is containers is coming in. Why? Because that was a symbol defined in the, in the package. Down below, we also see deny, and deny is also defined in the package. One of the things we use all the time here is that we can go ahead and highlight portions of the policy in order to uh, do a partial evaluation of it. That was a wrong, poor choice of words there. If we want to part, evaluate just a part of the policy, then we can do it that way. If you like, and I'll, I will stop here very quickly, um, you can even highlight entire fragments of the policy and ask uh, for an evaluation. And there are different reasons for doing that. But we're running low on time. OK. Oh, OK. Let's go through that. All right. Let's switch. I'll give it back over to Torin to start talking about new features. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, so you know, what we announced at the keynote was this new ability to take uh, Rego policies and basically compile them into WebAssembly. And actually, before I get into this, you know, a bunch of the things that we're going to talk about right now might seem a little bit like weird. 
Um, but they're all kind of like around this idea of improving the performance um, of policy evaluations. That's sort of the theme that we have right now is to kind of, in, you know, sort of deliver a bunch of optimizations um, that really allow open to be used in, in some new ways that are quite interesting. So um, what we added in the most recent, what we completed in the most recent release was like an incremental set of work to um, be able to take Rego policies and compile them down into WebAssembly. Um, WebAssembly is this standard instruction format for, for a virtual machine uh, that's supported by major browsers. It allows you to take arbitrary code and get it compiled down and have it run in the browser. So you can write you know, a front end in Go or Rust or whatever. Um, but it also supports this idea of a non-web embedding. And there are all these different products and companies and projects that are adding kind of uh, uh, WebAssembly runtimes um, into, their, into, the, into the code so that they can be extended or um, you know, support kind of like new, 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 new types of um, applications. And so we thought it would be great if we could leverage those, those existing WebAssembly runtimes with OPA. Um, and so we started working on this. And so now uh, what you can do is you can use OPA to take your policies and compile them into WebAssembly. Um, there are two ways of kind of doing this. One is just on the command line. So you can give OPA basically the, the, the policies. It could be one or more policies. Um, and then a query to, 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 to compile. And then what OPA does is it basically takes that, that query and those policies and it generates a plan and then it compiles that plan into a WebAssembly binary. So this is something you'd probably end up doing in your development environment uh, or in a CI environment whenever the, the policies change. Um, and then the idea is that you'll take those WebAssembly executables and you'll publish them somewhere so that they can be downloaded, um, just like you do today with, with regular OPA bundles. Um, but now instead of just shipping the raw Rego down to the OPAs, or down to the enforcement points, I should say, you'd, you'd send down these, these WASM uh, executables. Um, so today we have support for like a, a Node.js SDK. So if you want to try to experiment with, with this functionality, that's where I kind of recommend you start is, is play around with it inside of Node.js. Um, but in the two or three days that after we kind of talked about this and announced it, uh, somebody already started working on a C-sharp uh, SDK as well. So you know, in the future, we plan to have SDKs for C, C++, C-sharp, JVM, um, and on and on. Um, there are some things that are kind of like missing today. Uh, and so the, the plan improvements right now are around extending support for built-in functions out, out of the box. You can implement the built-in functions inside of the, the host language, the host environment, if you want to. Um, but obviously, you don't want to have to do that you know, every single time. And so we're going to try to have more built-in functions supported out of the box um, as much as possible. And then we're also going to focus on, on the, the SDK side, which will involve like adding support for the management APIs, right? So that you can kind of have an out-of-the-box way of getting policies distributed down to your enforcement points. That's WebAssembly. Um, one thing that, that hasn't been worked on but we're, that we're planning to do is improve uh, support for partial evaluation in OPA. Um, so partial evaluation is a feature that we added in, in 2018. And it's got a lot of interesting applications. But what it does is it basically um, allows you to take a policy um, and then kind of evaluate it to produce a new policy that's much simpler uh, and faster to execute. Um, so for example, here we have a policy that says allow is true if um, any one of the, the ACLs in this data set um, match the input. And so here what we're basically doing is we're just searching over this large ACLs, this, this, this ACLs array, and we're seeing if any of those match the, the input action resource user. Now obviously, um, if that array gets really big, we're still doing a linear scan, and so the evaluation time is going to go up. And so I'll talk about how that works in a second. But the important thing to notice here is that um, before the policy gets evaluated, certain pieces of the policy may be already known, right? So in this case, data.acls is already known, right? It may be shipped down to OPA along with the policy itself, right? So every time the permissions are updated, it would just get sent down to OPA. The input, though, is a little bit different, right? That's unknown. That changes on every single policy query. Um, and so what partial evaluation does is it kind of lets us pre-evaluate the policy and remove a lot of the complexity in it and simplify it into a, into a format that's, that's easier for OPA to understand and easier for it to optimize. And so if you ran partial evaluation um, on this policy and you said that input was the unknown, then it would produce something like on the, on the right-hand side here it would give you back a set of queries that are just simple um, equality operations. And the, the cool thing about these equality operations is that OPA can understand them, and it can build an index out of, out of these, these statements uh, so that when you actually go to ask, you know, should this thing be allowed, it doesn't have to scan over all the ACLs. It can quickly look up the, one, uh, the, the statements that match and only execute those. So you'd get basically constant time uh, evaluation. 
Today, there are some like, limitations in, in partial evaluation in OPA, so there's certain parts of the language that we can't partially evaluate. And so the plan in the next few months will be to kind of like extend the coverage of partial evaluation uh, to cover things like array and set comprehensions that only depend on, on known values. Um, so those will just get partially evaluated out. Uh, and then we're also going to add support for the with keyword inside the language. Today, if, it, if open counters any of those while it's partially evaluating the policy, then it just saves them off and you get them in the result. And so that doesn't really have any um, benefit. I think that's it. So then I'm going to let Tim kind of talk about uh, complexity analysis, or are we out of? What time do we have? Uh, it says oh. zero, zero, but I don't know what that last digit is. All right, I'll make this super fast. Uh, the other thing that we're looking at, uh, and this is, again, or very early, it's something that is going to happen more so than it has happened, um, is to do some automated complexity analysis. So one of the things we've learned uh, from writing lots and lots of policies is that there are quite obviously very different classes of policies. Like there are some, for example, uh, the, the one that we did a moment ago where we're walking over all of the containers in the pod that run in time linear in the size of the input. Um, there are others, though, like, for example, if you were going to check if a label exists, that are going to run in time, uh, in time constant in the, in the size of the, of the input. Um, and so one of the things we're looking at is uh, being able to automatically detect, um, at least when we can detect it, um, when the pol which class the policy belongs to. And the benefit there is then that uh, as a, like a cluster level administrator, you could say, well, all of my namespace level administrators, you can put policies in, but only if they run in time linear in the size of the input. So that's kind of where we're going with that. And it's something that we can do because open is declarative, because it's not Turing complete, that you just typically wouldn't see in a programming language. Yeah. All right, well, um, thank you all for coming. We have, I think maybe we can answer questions for as long until they kick us out, but um, Oh, yeah. that's good. Okay, so they're saying we have seven minutes, so there's plenty of time for questions. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. That, that is a thing that exists. There's a built-in today called HTTP Send. You can go and use that to hit an external HTTP server. As Torin mentioned at the beginning, or at some point, we don't recommend that unless you really need to. And there are legitimate cases where there's really no other alternative rather than getting data fresh. If the data comes out of a... A terabyte or a petabyte size database, or and, and you therefore can't replicate it into OPA, or if the data is changing very frequently, then and you always have to have the the latest and greatest. There's not much else you can do. So we do have initial support for that, but as we've mentioned, architecturally the goal is to avoid that, push OPA to the edge, give it all the information it needs to make decisions, so that every decision can be made uh, completely on OPA's own. Yes. Support. Oh, sorry. We should repeat the question. Uh, support for validating cryptographic signatures. Um, yeah. So if you go to the uh, so, like JSON web tokens, or what are you what are you thinking? Um, yeah. So we, we do have built in support. We have built in functions to verify um, signatures on JSON web tokens today. So we support RSA and and, and other. Um, uh, algorithms. We don't have like primitives to just do that on a on a like a like on an array of bytes. Um, but um, built-in functions are actually like the easiest way to contribute to OPA. So if you have a have a use case where you think, oh, this would be a lot easier. Like I was talking to somebody earlier today, and they wanted to do something that involved bit manipulation, like and and that that's not something that's um, particularly fun to do today in in uh, Rego. Um, so I said, yeah, I mean, please, you know, if you have use cases that require built-ins, please submit a patch. People. So in the example that you coded, you created a helper method because a lot of the fields exist in containers and in the containers. Mm. When I started writing policies, especially around like security contexts, and you look at all the places that the pod template spec exists, there's literally 16 places in the API, like deployments, daemon sets, public mm. sets, staple sets. And then I started creating that. It, got, you got mm. you know, I mean, I think the, well, 
uh, sorry, the question was um, security contexts, for example, show up in a large number of Kubernetes resources. It'd be great if there were some helper libraries or the like that would allow people to write policy over um, all of those sort of simultaneously. Yeah, so certainly building those kinds of libraries is great, um, and that's another good place where you can contribute. So if you have ideas about uh, libraries, that would be great. Uh, that, that would be certainly, uh, we, we'd love to see that. I think one thing that uh, we've hesitated on um, is that, with, especially in the Kubernetes case, with CRDs, uh, people could invent things that we just don't know or understand. And so at the end of the day, like uh, having a, a library um, um, could give people a sense of security because they do, a false sense of security, thank you, when in fact they need to understand what is covered by that and what is not. Uh, so that would be the, the pros and cons there, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the question is, do we have guidelines on when you should use like a cloud provider's IAM versus OPA? Specifically around Kubernetes? Specifically, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so Kubernetes, you know, it has role-based access control, right? And and that is typically, I think, where people use um, where where IAM comes in is when you're talking about authorization. Um, and like, we're not trying to say that OPA should replace role-based access control in any way. Um, RBAC solves you know, some portion of your, 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 your use cases, um, but there's sort of a long tail of, of things that you need to be able to lock down, and, and you know, the example that Tim gave, gave is not something that you can express in, with role-based access control or with IAM or anything like that, right? Um, so the two are kind of complementary. Um, if you can express it in, in IAM, that, that's, that's good, um, but there's tons of things that you can't express and that you need something like OPA for. Question is, we uh, pointed uh, out using OPA for admission control. Has anybody ever used OPA for authentication? Authentication. Sorry, sorry, authorization. Oh, for authorization. Okay, yeah. So for authorization, uh, a couple of times, yeah, we've heard people doing this. Uh, it's possible. There are webhooks for that. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a blog post from um, uh, some folks at Daimler that run um, a fairly large number of clusters, and they ran into a problem where they want to just express a blacklist basically for at authorization time as opposed to having to like whitelist. It, the use case was like, you know, you want to grant developers access to every namespace except kube system, right? And so that's pretty painful to do if you've got namespaces coming up all the time because you need to constantly be creating these RBAC um, objects. And so, uh, you know, OPA just lets you express that blacklist very easily. So there are use cases for it. Um, however, you can't dynamically configure authorization webhooks today. It's a it's a, it's a cluster setup thing. Um, and it's also risky to run like the authorizer on top of kube, like because it creates this, um, this loop. So um, it's definitely possible people do it, but you need to have more control over your clusters than you get um, in some cases. Uh, you already asked, let's go here. Question is, well, what happens if the input that comes in is malformed? For example, you dot down through an object that into a field that does, doesn't exist. Um, yeah, and so today, this is actually a, a case where uh, what we do today is just, uh, we think of all of the, the conditions in a rule as, as that, as conditions. So if you um, were to say input.request.foo in a Kubernetes uh, object, um, that would be something that we look at as a condition. If that, if that field does not exist, then the body of that rule fails. It is, it is effectively false, um, roughly speaking. Uh, so what we do is that, that we don't return null. We just, uh, the, the value of that expression becomes what we call undefined. Uh, and then undefined propagates. So there's a negation that will flip it undefined to true, but otherwise undefined propagates. So if you say if, input dot whatever foo and input dot foo is not defined equals seven, 
then the whole thing is undefined, and then the, the body just doesn't evaluate it true. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, um, are we going to use a full, are we going to require a full WASI interface? Um, I don't know how many people in this room know what WASI is. It's a, like a, it's a standard that's emerging for like the system call interface, basically, for WebAssembly executables. Um, the answer is that right now, the, the compiled WASM policies don't have any external dependencies, except for memory. Um, you need to give them an, uh, some memory to work with. Uh, but yeah, so they're, they're, they're kind of free on their own, so you don't have to worry about that. Question is for the bundle API, how fine tunable is it? Um, and then part two was, and then what happens when the bundle API actually pulls down data? Does it just replace everything? So, um, answer to the first part is yes, it's tunable. You can figure how often the bundle API runs and therefore how often it pulls down fresh, uh, a fresh bundle. Uh, and then for the second one, OPA does support multiple bundles. So uh, it, w it sort of has a scope when you download the bundle that says here's the, here's the part of the policy and data that gets replaced by this bundle. Thank you. Yeah, okay. New. Um, so I see on your integrations that you have an Envoy integration, um, which you generally uh, say that any sort of like control plane above Envoy is like uh, integrating, sorry, integrating um, OPA with Envoy is kind of like a control plane and toss it uh, with that, so like you get a faster on top of your Envoy to do it, you okay? Uh, so the question is whether or not you can run uh, OPA and Envoy together um, and, and still have like a higher level control plane that's involved. And I think the answer is yes. Um, when you, uh, you kind of like just configure the, the, the Envoy filter basically to talk to OPA. Um, like with Istio, they, they do provide a CRD that lets you do that. So it like works well there. I don't know about ambassadors specifically. Um, I will mention that there are, uh, there's a talk tomorrow from Yelp uh, about how they're using OPA and Envoy. So if you are interested in that use case, I'd recommend checking that out because um, they're doing it in a lot of different places. So, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, can you, can you repeat the question? as I understood it was, uh, we support JSON as input today. Uh, could we potentially support some binary format uh, coming in as input? Is that right? Yeah, that's what I heard. OK. Um, so, yeah, so yeah, so when we say JSON, we just mean kind of like any kind of complex hierarchical structured data. When you run OPA as a daemon, it exposes an HTTP API that allows you to ask it for policy decisions. And that API only supports JSON today. Um, if you embed OPA as a library in Go, you can have, you could have like protobuf, you know, serialized things coming into that service and then getting passed into OPA. Um, that's, that's actually how the Envoy plugin works. Um, we have a flavor of OPA for specifically integrating with Envoy. Um, yeah, there is there, yeah, anyway. Yeah. All right, you've been patient. So most of the policies I've seen are, are in the validating uh, webhook model. Mm -hmm. And a couple of things I want to do are more of the mutating model. For instance, like every time a user creates a namespace, you create a network policy that blacklists everything by default, or every time they create a pod, it injects either Istio or Linkerd as a zero trust mm -hmm. uh, model. Uh, is there a way to do that in OPA? Good question. Uh, it was. Uh, most of the examples are validating examples where we're just accept, accepting or uh, rejecting a new or, or updated um, resource. Uh, can you do anything around mutation and uh, potentially provisioning? So one other talk I'll call out here is 
tomorrow at 5.20. Yep. Yeah, same time. Uh, uh, Goldman Sachs is going to be talking about how they're doing provisioning. For example, provisioning RBOC in when a new uh, namespace is created. They're using Open to do that, so I'd recommend that. So yes, it's possible. And there's a, uh, um, you'll see me up again. If you, so that one I would recommend. And then mutation, yes. Um, uh, to say other than yes. Yeah, you can do it with, with OPA, and it's on the roadmap with Gatekeeper. It's something that we're kind of like discussing right now. So, yeah. All right, well, thank you very much.